This is how Sungazer almost was unable to recoup $17,000 in expenses from a recent tour. God, we're losing so much money on this tour. This is like the worst case scenario. How did this happen? What went wrong? What if I don't test negative? Please go. Today, we're going to be giving a detailed breakdown of all of our tour expenses, and we're also going to explore just why it's so risky to tour as an independent artist in the year 2022, and why we do it anyway. This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and my streaming service Nebula, where you can watch a companion bonus essay vlog. Sleep in the van. Wednesday is an indie rock band from Asheville, North Carolina that shared the accounting from a recent South by Southwest tour on Twitter. They revealed that they lost about $100 on this tour. Now, this thread went viral not because of the exploitative nature of South by Southwest's compensation for bands and that there is none, but because of the perceived exorbitance of Wednesday's operating expenses. Like, for example, $1,200 for an Airbnb, which seemed to touch a nerve. The refrain online seemed to be, just sleep in the van. Just sleep in the van and stop bitching. You sleep in van slash tour vehicle. Sleep in the van. Sleep in the van. You should have slept in the van. Sleep in the van. Sleep in the van. You can see from the responses to this thread that on some level, poor living conditions and poor working conditions for musicians are socially policed. Poverty is expected, places to sleep are considered wild extravagances. There is little, if anything, that could be used to justify the touring expenses for a band. Not because South by Southwest exploits labor, but because consumers of music demand a starving artist. The narrative is that if you aren't struggling, you're not doing music right. And this narrative is reinforced by other musicians, other people who have suffered indignities, other crabs in the bucket. One band suggested that Wednesday should have spent days off on their tour doing gig economy jobs. Another insisted that being in a band is supposed to be a slog. Another bragged about sleeping in a van with a herniated disc and asthma. To even talk about the expenses of touring a band on social media is to quibble about breadcrumbs. It is a discourse that is dominated by hustle culture. Sounds like you expect things to be handed to you. You have to grind to make that dream work. If touring is expensive, you are weak. The less expensive you make touring, the stronger you are. Sleep in the van. The lesson to be learned here is that it is not in a band's best interest to share how they spend their money on tour because they will be punished for it. Anyway, we're rehearsing for Sungazer's upcoming West Coast tour right now. The tour started with me flying from New York to Denver. I had to pay for two bags and also a taxi for my equipment. Jared Yee, our touring sax player, was on another tour with the band Evolfo and ended up in Denver at the same time. So we actually saved money from his flight out from New York. Very serendipitous. I stayed with Sean Crowder for a few days. This time was spent mostly rehearsing in the basement, ironing out technical issues that come from running two laptops on a stage at the same time. Okay, so we spent the better part of a couple of days trying to figure out how to get this machina arpeggiator working and we're turning. <laughs> Tour rehearsal was in a church common area, which was lent to us for free, which helped out a lot. New jumpsuits, baby. New tour, new jumpsuits. We had a modest costuming budget. <laughs> <laughs> Our first gig was at the Cervantes Masterpiece Ballroom in Denver on April 1st. A short drive from where we were staying, basically a local gig. First gig of the tour tonight, we're playing in Denver. Are you guys ready? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> We had a special guest for the show, the YouTuber Charles Cornell. I'm not gonna lie here, his uh, his appearance fee was quite exorbitant. Charles Cornell's <clears throat> warm up routine. He does this every time he plays. Every time. <laughs> Man, you can't, you can't skip out on the routine. Uh, go for it. Yeah. All right, let's do it. The show ended up selling out and was an absolute blast. <laughs> The whole night was extremely thick. Like a really fantastic way to start the tour. It was also fun to figure out what would work with our special guest given the limited rehearsal time. The way this is gonna work is we're going to announce you as the special guest. We just had a new member of the band and uh, I, th I think it would be kind of fun to bring him out right now to play some tunes with us.
Cool. Here we go. So, when Sungazer tours, we hire musicians to come and play for us. The band Sungazer, as a business, is a partnership between myself and Sean Crowder. We split the financial risk and reward 50-50. The musicians that play for us do not share in that risk and reward, and instead we negotiate a flat fee ahead of time. We hire them as independent contractors. In the industry parlance, they are hired guns. This is generally the arrangement when I play with other bands, like the New York Chill Harmonic or Aberdeen, I'm part of the band, but I don't share the risk and reward with the band leader. Creative control and financial risk are divided differently. For this run, we hired Jared Yee on tenor sax and our normal touring keyboardist, Christian Lee, who couldn't make the first show, hence Charles Cornell. We hired our buddy Brian Plouts to help out with advancing the tour, which is the process of getting all the logistics squared away with venues in advance of the tour. All told, personnel fees for this tour cost us roughly $3,400. So after the Denver show, Jared was actually already on tour with another oh, that's band. Right. So Jared went off to do these other gigs. We first picked up the van at, do you remember the uh, address for the, the budget rental? It was like 420 Collier Street. No, no, no. Yeah. even better. <laughs> 251 Collier Street. <laughs> the van rental, which would carry drums and equipment for the rest of the tour from April 4th to April 18th, was $2,814. The plan was to drive from Denver to LA, where we would meet Jared and Christian to play the next gig. That was the plan, anyway. And then we went to LA a few days later. We ended up spending $281 in gas to get to LA, drove about 10 hours, and then spent $170 on a double motel room in Las Vegas. We just made it to Las Vegas. And you know what they say about Las Vegas. <sighs> Hope your tenor sax player doesn't get COVID. Um, have you uh, tested positive or? Okay, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> ah, shit, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's all right. If you're like negative and feeling better by the San Francisco hit, um, right. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that, that. That sucks, man. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, so Jared's not joining us for the rest of the tour. We could still play these shows trio with Christian, but at the same time, like, losing Jared is like, oh. Oh, yeah. You, you want was... Jared Yee on. God, you want him. It was, it was... You want him there. <laughs> <laughs> that was disappointing, for sure. If we were positive, then, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, we'll... We're beast. So, you know. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Here we go. We just assumed that we were fine. But later that night, we took uh, antigen tests, and it turns out uh, we weren't fine. Uh, yeah, LA is out. LA is out. Um, and uh, turns out I had it. So if either Adam and I get sick, it's kind of game over at that point. I mean, I'm, I'm negative. I mean, obviously, we would want me to test negative before. If, uh, the, I'm just trying to think of like logistics here. Touring has become so risky for yeah. artists in this era because you could start a tour and in this case, it was the worst possible scenario, meaning that you get COVID at the beginning of the tour, you've already spent all the money on the expenses, the flights, the hotels, etc., cetera, yeah. van rental, gas to get out there. And then you have potentially none of the income 
Right. To offset that. Christian's original flight to LA was $130, plus baggage, plus taxi. He was planning on staying with a friend while in LA, so we didn't need to put him up. Sean and I had to have separate rooms during quarantine. I spent two days in LA, and Sean spent the first four days of quarantine in one hotel. So there we were, looking at a lot of potential lost income from shows in LA and Portland and Seattle and four shows in San Francisco. These are shows that we originally budgeted for. Well, fuck. Because of the original routing on this tour, we did have several days between LA and the next shows. Also fortunate for us, the venues in LA, Portland, and Seattle had empty slots for the week after our tour, meaning potentially we could reschedule. That would be expensive though, extending a tour another week with no more income, and that's a lot to ask for our hired guns. We elected to try a different strategy. LA was on April 6th. The next show was going to be up in Portland on April 9th. And yet, in theory, someone could drive the van up. I mean, I guess if you and drove I, the van up, I would like to stay here in LA and then flew. If uh, everybody's testing negative by that point, we can probably safely go ahead with those shows. Maybe like booking the flight at the last moment and then getting up to Portland like once you have the negative test. Going ahead with the Portland and Seattle shows was a bit of a gamble because if it didn't work, I would drive up the whole West Coast for nothing and waste a lot of money on gas. But if it worked and Sean tested negative, it would save a week worth of expenses. What if I don't test negative? Uh, I feel really bad because we haven't announced uh, that we're rescheduling yet and uh, you know, I'm getting tweets like this. No, you're not seeing Sungazer tonight. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It sucks. Time to drive 15 hours by myself. Woo! Let's listen to some Dan Carlin, I guess. It's history. Hey, Dave, put you in the lift. It would end up taking me two days to drive up to Portland, including a stay overnight in Southern Oregon, costing $304 in gas, plus $90 for a motel. And after all that driving, it turns out the gamble didn't work. Sean was still positive. I'll, I guess, start the flurry of emails and stuff. The worst part about this is I feel fine. Fortunately, from the symptoms side of things, it was very mild for me, but because there are people that we're interacting with and that are close to the bands that it could be more of an issue for. Yeah. Uh, we had to call off or reschedule a couple shows. We couldn't play the Seattle and Portland shows as planned. They would have to be postponed a week and I would have to drive back down the West Coast to meet the rest of the band in San Francisco. So I'm still negative, which is good, I guess, but you know, I haven't played bass in like a week and I'm on tour right now. <laughs> Ugh. All told, my four nights spent in the Pacific Northwest and driving back down would cost $523 in hotels plus an additional $293 in gas. Regular? Yeah. In Oregon, uh, you can't pump your own gas. Not sure why, but hey. States rights, I guess. While I was driving, there were some logistics that needed to be taken care of. I'll cancel whatever needs to be canceled. The extra days in the van rental plus the thousands of miles of overage going up and down the West Coast would cost $1,767. I've got to find another hotel. The rates are insane. Uh, if I stay here. Sean would take a cab to a cheaper LA hotel and spend $505 to finish out his quarantine. To fly the remaining three members of the band up to San Francisco cost us an additional $525 plus baggage plus taxis. Picking up everybody at the airport right now. Get to finally play some music today. Woo. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to my world. Okay, yeah. Dear Lord, that gas receipt. God, we're losing so much money on this tour. The hotel rooms in San Francisco were subsidized by the venue that we were playing at, coming in at an estimated $500 for three nights. Now this number is terrifying, it's five figures, especially considering at this point we had only played one gig. Like, in order to even come close to breaking even, we would need to sell out every show that we played on the tour. Yo. Sold out, daddy. Woo! Both shows, but both shows are sold out. Okay. But, I'll but finally, we could start playing shows. We would be playing four sold out shows at the Black Cat in San Francisco, which is normally a jazz venue. At the Black Cat, we were treated very, very well, which is normally the case for jazz venues versus rock venues. Look at that, look at that. Rice. There's 
sometimes a musical class divide between how jazz musicians are treated on tour versus rock musicians. Just to give a fun example, for the two nights of the Black Cat, they were serving a cocktail menu with cocktails based around our song titles, which I thought was amazing. Ooh, that smells good. It was nice, but we were several weeks in on a tour that was hemorrhaging money. Even though these shows were sold out, it was a bit unclear if we were going to be able to recoup all of these expenses. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Sunday's song. Sean Crowder on the drums. It's becoming extremely common for touring bands to have to cancel or postpone shows due to COVID exposure, even with triple vaxxing. The question has become less if, but when. There is a clause in Sungazer's contracts with venues giving us the ability to cancel or reschedule due to COVID, no questions asked, but that doesn't mean that we'll get paid. A CBC article from last August interviewed touring artists about the potential financial calamity of musicians getting COVID while on the road. Insurance currently does not cover COVID-related cancellations in quarantine and likely never will. COVID is on its way to being endemic. And so, live music now becomes a terrible roll of the dice for independent artists. You go on tour with the risk that somebody gets COVID and the dates have to be canceled? Can you afford to go that deep into the red if it does? A Twitter thread from Tamara Lindemann of the band The Weather Station chronicles the fears from bands, noting that, we're all double vaxxed and not concerned about health risk. The problem is that a single positive test, even an asymptomatic infection, shuts down tour for 14 days, which is exactly what happened to us. With all of that doom and gloom, why would anybody try something like this? It doesn't seem like it would be a profitable activity at all. Why indeed? Oh. Hell yeah. It kind of feels good to play music again. There's a certain energy about like, uh, you haven't played music in a long time and mm. you're just like burning to play music. Especially since this is like two weeks since we ended up starting the tour. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. Two weeks without music making. Yeah. After four amazing sold out shows in San Francisco at the Black Cat and a close call with a vehicle malfunction. <laughs> Please go. Is it just a battery? Oh, okay. Just gotta pump that gas pedal. <laughs> Uh, okay. Whew, that would have sucked. We drove down to LA for the first of the rescheduled shows. Headed down to LA today. Two hotel rooms in LA would cost $340 and gas would cost $93. Grace Kelly is uh, down to sit in tonight. We drove down to LA to play the rescheduled show at the Terragram Ballroom, which was... That was a fun uh, show. Uh, sick. Feel the rhythm. Feel the ride! Get on up! It's bobsled time! What's up, LA? In 2014, the band Pomplamoose published a blog post entitled Pomplamoose 2014 Tour Profits or Lack Thereof. The band had taken a $12,000 loss on a four week tour, even though the shows had sold extremely well. The band had enjoyed a fair amount of internet notoriety up until this point, and the post was clearly intended to show the financial realities of a touring band playing 1,000 cap rooms. They detailed their expenses in depth, including insurance, backline rental, hotels and crew salaries, and everything you might expect a business to provide for their employees as they travel. Some of the responses to this blog were constructive and offered ways to budget for a similar sized tour and still turn a profit, but the majority of these responses were vitriolic, to say the least. <laughs> Many touring musicians who for years had sacrificed personal comfort and dignity to stretch thin budgets on the behalf of those who might exploit their labor were absolutely livid. They relentlessly chastised the band for what they perceived as extravagant expenses. Musicians are expected to struggle. It is part of the narrative. It went a little bit beyond this though because media outlets began to publish scathing op-eds. 
Thank you, LA. The idea of a bed to sleep in seemed especially controversial here. <laughs> Noisy by Vice insisted that their touring crew should sleep in the van or sleep in the grass, or, if they're feeling adventurous, ask the promoter for a couch to sleep on. Sleep in the van. Gawker 2 demanded that the band sleep in the van. Sleep in the van! Alternative Press also scoffed at the idea of professionals having their own bed to sleep in. Does each person in your touring party need their own bed? No, they don't. It's piss poor budgeting on your part if you feel like you need four hotel rooms every night. <laughs> Alternative Press would also chastise the idea of compensation for employee labor, insisting that musicians should always work on spec. Pitchfork also published a now-deleted op-ed questioning the necessity of paying a backing band. These responses to Pomplamoose's tour accounting seem to originate from a punk rock, anti-materialist DIY ethos. People eager to share that if you want to, and you have the ability to tour by sleeping in a van, you certainly can do that. How are we all feeling tonight? For those who are able and willing, it might be the most practical way to tour. Hell yeah. But this DIY ethos metastasizes quickly into anti-labor rhetoric, in relentlessly questioning the necessity of fair working conditions and compensation. The argument being made, effectively, is that living expenses are shameful, and the idea of paying for labor is downright offensive. Does each person in your touring party need their own bed? No, they don't. Now, touring is very expensive. It's ecologically dubious. It might not be a good idea to even do. And even if you are able-bodied, it is very physically demanding. But in my experience, anyway, of sharing music and sharing in moments with people, I would argue that live music has value. It is work and those who do it deserve to do it with dignity, like anybody who works. Remember last year when everybody got mad that Amazon drivers had to pee in bottles? Seems like we should allow bands to also have that basic level of self-respect and dignity too. You see, people think that playing music isn't a job. It's a job. LA ended up being a great show. It didn't sell out, but it was still very well attended and it was, it was so much fun. I, God, I love it. I loved it so much. We were able to have Grace Kelly as a, a surprise guest. Grace Kelly is going to sit in with us on a tune. Check. Make sure all the idiots are here. One, Present. two, three, four. Present. Great, we got it. So Christian had to go. He had to go back to teaching because he couldn't extend the tour, understandably. Christian's flight back would cost $255 plus baggage plus taxis for equipment. Where are we, y'all? Weed, California. Jared, Sean, and I then spent the time driving up the West Coast for our rescheduled Portland date and spent $324 on gas and $619 for two nights of three hotel rooms. Since we had been selling out shows, we felt comfortable each having our own hotel room. In Portland, we played at stage 722. Like, how would you describe 722? Yeah, it's almost like a converted warehouse or old, uh, I don't know, factory or something. Yeah. It was hard to play it without Christian because we had just played five shows, like right. really solidifying how the set's supposed to feel and like yeah, yeah. getting all the little quirks out. And then, okay, now we're back to just playing trio. We can do it. Like, we, yeah, have, yeah. we have enough stuff in the Ableton setup. It will still sound super full. And it's just fun to have more people on stage, there's more opportunity for interaction. And... There's a question here where does it become uneconomical to keep adding more people? 
to a, a band because we have played it as a five piece, we played it as a three piece. <laughs> big bands died off. It's just, it's just you can't have 18 people and make that work financially. Each person is adding their fees plus hotels and flights and I mean it's thousands and thousands of dollars in all of that combined for a single person. Weirdly because Christian couldn't continue the tour we were able to save more money and come closer to breaking even with this whole thing. Even though we probably would have wanted him just for the sake of like all right we're, we might lose money anyway let's just make this the best music we can and make yeah. it with the fourth person. Yeah, there's there's always a human calculus here with touring and who can be brought on when. Portland was great, and soon we were on our way up to the last of the rescheduled shows in Seattle. Two days of hotel rooms and parking in Seattle cost us $954 in hotel rooms and $104 in gas to get up there. Here we are at the Nectar Lounge. Seattle at the Nectar Lounge was another sold out show, which ended up being a fantastic way of ending a tour that had started so poorly. <laughs> As we've seen, touring can be expensive. One blog cited a $17,000 floor for the most basic level of professional touring expenses. By that metric, Sungazer barely counts as professional. This was a very DIY tour. We weren't traveling with a crew like a front of house engineer or a tour manager or anybody. Yeah, I mean, we're running a very streamlined uh, project and it's still very expensive, so. After Seattle, Jared and I flew back to New York adding another $650 plus baggage plus taxis. Sean would have to drive from Seattle back down to Denver to return the car, adding $370 in gas and $129 for a hotel room. Mysterigun published an article, Why Are Musicians Expected to Be Miserable on Tour Just to Break Even, covering the incident around the band Wednesday and the expenses surrounding the South by Southwest tour. They interviewed Zachary Cole Smith of the band Dive, who noted that, quote, there's this expectation that musicians transcend the capitalist framework. Now, if you've been watching this video and you've been critiquing this number as it's been going higher and higher, think about that. Think about the relationship of music to the broader capitalist framework, how much it costs to travel, how much it costs to sleep, especially now. Part of the reason why I found the discourse around Wednesday's tour accounting so frustrating is because people kept attacking the musicians rather than considering their circumstances. Like, there has been a global pandemic. Touring is not like what it used to be. It is way riskier, and yet people still are screaming, sleep in the van. Sleep in the van. There's a time and a place for really roughing it. Um, and that was 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that this band is relatively new to touring. We don't really know what we're doing. This was our first West Coast tour. I'm sure there are things that we could do differently in the future. And please, if you are a road warrior, let us know in the comments what we did wrong it really helps with the algorithmic engagement. But there really isn't a clear course of action for what you're supposed to do when two members of your band contract COVID. Everyone has their opinion on this and they don't necessarily care what ours is. You know, some people will think yeah. we did too little, some will think we did too much. I think we did what we thought was right knowing the circumstances immediate to us. Now, thank God we were able to reschedule the shows and make it work the week after we were already out. It just so happened to work that way. Otherwise, we would have been on the hook for all of these expenses. What I can say though, is that we were able to recoup our expenses. The tour could have ended in disaster, but instead it ended up being a great success. And we wanna thank everybody for coming out and sharing in the music because it was honestly a really beautiful experience for us. Sun so Gazer is touring again in June if you want to come hang out with us in Europe. Now there's a bit of a philosophical question that happens when I'm making these tour vlogs. What is the narrative? How do you tell the story of the tour while you're actually playing it? Now in this case it's kind of easy because there was a lot of bad stuff that happened, but that doesn't change the fact that throughout the whole tour, Sean and I were having conversations about the different rooms that we were in. That was the original idea for the vlog. Physical bodies will 
change how you play the music. It changes the acoustics in the room, yeah, <laughs> yeah, on a fundamental level. I cut together some of those conversations from the tour and also included some bonus footage and a bonus video that you can watch right now over on Nebula. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service where I have not only my catalog, but also a bunch of fun bonus videos. Many other YouTube creators that you know and enjoy are also on Nebula who are also sharing bonus videos. It's a great way to watch and discover quality content ad-free, as well as support your favorite creators. Now, this video has a sponsor, and I want to say thank you to the sponsor because I was able to dedicate a month of my life to a tour that barely broke even because I could make a video about the tour. I want to give a big shout out to Curiosity Stream, the go-to source on the internet for the very best documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from, including Can a Computer Write a Hit Musical, a very fun look at algorithmic composition and the creative process. If you sign up now to Curiosity Stream with either the link in the description or Curiosity curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely, you'll also get a subscription to Nebula for free. A subscription to both of these wonderful streaming services will cost you $14.79 per year. That's a 26% discount. By clicking the link in the description, you're not only supporting this channel and other Sungazer tours, but you're also supporting the broader community over at Nebula as we create a platform that aims to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thank you everybody for watching. Peace.